What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs got to eat BDGE, fantasy football. We're switching things up a little bit. It is Thursday, and uh, since some of y'all's trade deadlines are later than mine, uh, we're going to keep pushing these pieces of content out for y'all. We are joined by my man Noah, um, at FBGod on Twitter. If you are a little bit of a Twitter head, you're probably following him already. Um, so make sure you are following him. He is a blogger for Big Dogs. He is also a college student, which uh, is that ridiculous background he has going on. It's like 9 a.m. right now, and he's up in his dorm room uh, like videotaping this. So I appreciate the effort, my man Noah. He's going to be probably joining us uh, moving forward, usually on the Thursday videos. I'm not really sure what we're going to be doing moving forward outside of the trade target videos, but give Noah a warm welcome. Make sure you uh, drop a comment down below. Let him know that, uh, that, that he sucks and let him know what he needs to work on because this is his first video. So we will improve as we go along. What's up, Noah? Say hi to the people. Say hi to the uh, big dog community. What's going on, guys? If you want some shitty advice, uh, that's sometimes right. You can follow me on Twitter at FBGod, um, F-B-G-A-W-D. That'll all be linked down below. So we are going to jump into the video with a few buy low guys, a few sell high guys that hopefully y'all are trade targeting. My last video kind of went bonkers, man. I hit that shit right on the head. We had Juju. We had Aaron Jones. We had David Johnson. Man, the revenue was gorgeous. We'll put it at that. But you know what? Let's play the intro. All right, so we're going to throw it back and forth. We're going to frisbee this a little bit. We're going to go buy low and then a sell high. You know, me and Noah are going to take turns picking players and whatnot. So my first sell high on this list is going to be Allen Robinson. Um, Chicago Bears, number one wide receiver. He finally gets back into the lineup in uh, week 10, and he kind of explodes. He goes six for eight, uh, 133 yards. The bigger picture here is the fact that I think people are gaining momentum when it comes to Allen Robinson and Trubisky, and they're really buying into this hype train, right? And Trubisky's been nonstop throwing up fantasy points left and right. However, that's going to be the case. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's going to be the case when you play against teams like – this is the last seven games that they had. Arizona, Tampa Bay, Miami, New England, the Jets, Buffalo, and Detroit without Darius Slay. Like, you couldn't have gotten a better slate of games – if you are an offense, especially through the passing game. So he went six for eight, 133 yards, caught two touchdowns. Um, now that's fantastic for all of you that probably didn't even play him up to this point. But that was just the first time since week two that Robinson had uh, clipped seven, seven targets, eclipsed five catches, or 65 receiving yards. He hadn't hit any of those three points in, uh, in a game since week two. Um, and, you know, fantasy players, as we usually do, we go off recency bias. And they're going to paint this picture in their head, like I said, of Allen Robinson, Trubisky kind of coming into their own. Robinson's finally healthy. This is what we've been waiting for if you drafted here. I'm here to tell you it's, it's, it's a facade. It's a, it's a fagazi we got going on here, right? His recent success is, um, in Trubisky's sense, is almost 100% dedicated to his running game. Like the floor he gives you is, is ridiculous. And uh, the schedule that I just mentioned has been also ridiculous. So unfortunately for Robinson, those things are not predictive going forward, right? His rushing ability, Trubisky's rushing ability doesn't help Robinson. Uh, the, the past schedule doesn't help Robinson. That's all great for Trubisky. However, he is still ranked 31st per pro football focus in quarterback rating in terms of passing. He is 18th per football outsiders, DVOA amongst quarterbacks. So he's connecting on a lot of deep balls. I see that. You know, that's the majority of where his yards are coming from. But he's making a lot of bad passes still. Um, I do see him improving a little bit week over week, but it's still against really poor defenses. However, when you look going forward, man, if you just take a look at the schedule um, that's on screen here, it's a nice little chart for y'all. What I'm looking at here is his remaining matchups are far from easy, right? He's going to get Xavier Rhodes in week 11. Then he's going to get Detroit again, who we just kind of lit up, but they're going to they're gonna have Darius Slay back at this point. Um, the Giants are definitely not a team you need to be scared of, but they are allowing the 28th most points to um, wide receivers, fantasy points. At this point, uh, the Rams will have a keep to lead back by week 14. Now, Green Bay is obviously the green that you see on that chart, um, which would you know implicate that it's an easier matchup. However, Jerry Alexander has been one of the best rookie cornerbacks in, in recent memory. And uh, if they stick him on Allen Robinson, it's not going to be an easy matchup. I mean, he already played uh, Green Bay. I think they played in week one or two, and he went like four for 60 or something like that. So it's not necessarily an easy matchup. And also, I included this, this chart on the right side, like the column on the right side. 
fantasy points allowed to the right wide receiver. Um, and, and pro football focus breaks that down for you. And the reason I did that, obviously, is because Allen Robinson runs the majority of his routes on the, on the, the right side of the field. And you have um, Detroit, Xavier Rhodes in Minnesota, and like Richard Sherman, all allowing the fewest points to receivers on the right side. So I guess the point being, going forward, like Allen Robinson had this big week, and a lot of people are going to build up the story in their head. However, the schedule was super easy. It gets a lot tougher. Trubisky is still not a great passer. Um, you can't equivalent the fact that he's a good fantasy player with the fact that his wide receivers are going to eat because they're far too inconsistent at this point. And to be honest with you, going forward, like, no, who would you rather have going forward at this point, Allen Robinson or Anthony Miller? Assuming it's – I know, like, it, Robinson will probably get the straight-up answer, but I feel like his matchups going forward are pretty tough. And Miller, if he's going to continue to run from the slot, like, there could be – I wouldn't be surprised if Miller outscored Robinson going forward. Yeah, he's getting a lot of looks out of the slot, and obviously those are typically easier matchups. Just looking at his schedule, I mean, most of those pass defenses aren't too imposing overall, but on the outside, it's obviously much, much tougher for Allen Robinson as opposed to his slot work. And I believe Robinson's seen something like seven targets each of the last four games or something around there, and he's really produced. So, I mean, with Trubisky not throwing a whole hell of a lot and, like, Tariq Cohen and – Allen Robinson and Trey Burton and Anthony Miller. I mean, there's not a lot to really go around. Yeah, no, it's it's one of those teams where it's like you can get hyped up about it, but it's it's going to come back to recency bias again and again. The guy who you want to start in this team, whether it's, you know, we've seen it already. It's Taylor Gabriel three weeks ago when he was the hot hand at wide receiver. Now it's Allen Robinson now, and then next week it might be Anthony Miller again. It's like you never know what you're going to get in this offense. So that's why it's it's definitely a time to sell high. Jordan Howard has been on this list like six times already this year. So it's like, I would get out of the Bears offense, not because they're a bad offense, but just because it's, you know, sometimes trying to predict a starter in an offense like that is costly to you because, you know, it's very hard to do so. So that's my first um, sell high candidate, Allen Robinson. We're going to shift things over to Noah. Um, who do you got for a buy low? Or, I mean, you could go sell high, buy low. Who, who do you, what kind of trade movements are we making here, Noah? All right, we're buying real low on John Brown. I mean, the guy okay. just came off a bye, so he obviously put up zeros that week. He hasn't really done much in, like, recent history, although he has seen seven targets in six out of nine games and six or more in seven out of nine. I mean, uh, fuck. All right. Kind of it's it's all good. Roll with it. We're going to buy low on John Brown. Last week, put up a dud because he had a bye. Weeks before that, really <laughs> hasn't done much, but he's still put up seven or more targets in six out of nine games, six or more in seven out of nine games. He's getting a lot of the air yards there. I think he's third in the league in air yards with over like a thousand or something like that. He's third in the league with uh, in the average depth of target, only behind Deshaun Jackson and Kenny Stills. I mean, if you look at his schedule coming up from weeks 11 on, he gets the Bengals, Raiders, Falcons, Chiefs, Buccaneers, Chargers, and Browns. Woo! I'm on Fantasy Pros, you can look at uh, how many points these defenses allow to wide receivers. These guys allow the 10th, 11th, 3rd, 14th, 2nd, 13th, and 4th most points to the position. In other words, John Brown is about to eat. His offense is throwing the ball uh, the most times per game in the NFL. They don't trust Alex Collins because the guy just puts the ball on the ground. They brought in Ty Montgomery, who isn't going to do anything. And Javoris Allen is just a leech that does nothing. <laughs> and if you look at the games that John Brown hasn't really produced – it's games where he's seen lockdown corners like Tredavious White and um, Tredavious White and Joe Hayden. And the other ones are when cornerbacks were running 4.42 uh, 40 times or faster. And I believe we see the same split with Brandon Cooks. When he faces a guy who's like just as fast as him, they kind of lock him down. So the speed is a big factor here. Yeah, if you look at the guys he's faced, like Bradley Roby or um, – other guys that he's faced, they all ran a 4-3-9, a 4-4-2, a 4-3-3. I mean, and we saw Dory Jackson this past week kind of shut down uh, Josh Gordon, who we had to face off, like face off against. I mean, Josh Gordon still went for 80-something yards, but it was mostly off of one big play. And John Brown kind of gives you that upside where they're going to throw the ball a lot. They're going to throw it deep. He hasn't done much recently. You're paying like a wide receiver four, wide receiver three price for him. And this is a guy who early in the year – was seen as a wide receiver, wide receiver too, like upon consensus. The guy has one of the easiest schedules I've ever seen. I mean, it's a damn cakewalk to the championship. You're not paying a lot for him. He could potentially bring you the fantasy title. Yeah, I actually saw a lot of people. He was dropped in a few leagues. I got a lot of questions about like whether they should drop him to pick up someone else. And looking at his schedule, like you said, like anytime he's playing, 
lockdown cornerback, those are the games in which he's pretty much struggled. But like Cincinnati at home, Oakland at home, Atlanta, Kansas City, like none of those have shut down cornerbacks. Uh, Tampa Bay in week 15, maybe the first time you see that is the Chargers with Hayward and all the way in week 16. But like by that point, if, if Brown has been producing, you know, you're good to uh, grab him. My, my concern is not, not necessarily my concern, but it's like the reason I think he's dipped off a little bit is because Flacco overall started off so hot and then he's dipped off a little bit. Um, now the injury news kind of concerns me with Flacco. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I'm not inclined to say that it's a benefit to John Brown. If um, Lamar Jackson ends up coming under center, you know, we don't, we don't know what the injury status is right now, but um, I don't know. What's your take? Like, do you like John Brown more or less? If I, we don't even know who the quarterback's going to be, if it's Lamar Jackson or RG three, like I, I, I feel like it's going to be a downgrade because Lamar Jackson is probably going to end up throwing, like 22 passes a game because if he drops back 32 times, he's going to run it 10 times. You know, I feel like that, that could be a silent, um, a killer to a guy like John Brown though. Yeah. I believe like Joe Flacco is the perfect fit for him. He just throws the ball deep and doesn't care what the hell happens to it. Yeah. But I mean, if they get Lamar Jackson back there, I feel like he can extend plays with his legs and maybe just stretch the field with him. I mean, he obviously probably won't get the same amount of targets, but maybe the quality of targets will be better because Joe Flacco is just throwing that shit to the moon. I mean, yeah, Joe Flacco's like one yard or 51 yards. There's <laughs> no in between with him. Yeah, uh, yeah, I like that call. I like John Brown just because he's so, so cheap. He's, he's someone that's been on this list a while. And I, I know in my midseason award video, I put him as like a, someone who could really bust open the second half of the year just because the schedule is so damn good. Like everyone's yeah. talking about how Lamar Jackson. And next week, he actually gets the Bengals. And the past couple of weeks, they faced, who, they faced Deshaun Jackson, who put up three catches, 68 yards, and a touchdown. And before that, they faced Tyreek Hill, who dropped 768 and one on them. So, I mean, if you're going to buy, buy now because the Bengals can't stop anybody. Yeah, it's that small, those small speedy types that get over on them. Oh, so we got Allen Robinson, sell high. We got John Brown, buy low. Um, we have another wide receiver on the sell high list that I'm going to get into. And this is Kenny Smooth, Kenny G of the Detroit Lions. And, I mean, this one hurts to say because, you know, Golden Tate gets moved to the Eagles. And there goes 26, 27% of the target share. Um, and I think everyone, everyone assumed, and, you know, rightfully so, that, like, at worst, you know, Kenny G and, and Marvin Jones were going to get a piece of, of these targets. And it would be a small bump to Galladay's volume. And you look at the first game where Tate wasn't there. Galladay saw just four targets. And on Sunday, <clears throat> looking at the box score, he had a bounce back game. Um, he caught six of 13 targets. So he had 13 targets, caught six of them for 78 yards and a touchdown. And this is the reason why I'm telling you to sell him now, because if you look at that game, that's not efficient whatsoever. And it's not, um, I'm not excited about that as a Galladay owner. I've been trying to ship him out as much as I could in, in the leagues that I own him in. <clears throat> 78 yards on 13 targets is wildly inefficient. And the bigger picture here, I think, is the fact that Detroit's offense is struggling so much right now without Golden Tate. Like he was Stafford's favorite weapon for what, like four years now. So it's like, you get rid of the quarterback's favorite weapon, and I feel like he kind of looks lost out there. And you're seeing that the targets are not necessarily going to Galladay or Jones. It's Riddick and Carrion Johnson. Both have seen, like, pretty big increases in both targets and receptions over the last two games. So Kenny Galladay here, and I, I wanted to go back to this game because you see the breakout game, and people are like, okay, this is what I expected from Galladay when Tate wasn't in the lineup. Um, his, his Week 10 numbers, right? Like I said, 13 targets, 78 yards, and a touchdown. But Marvin Jones actually left this game <clears throat> with some kind of knee injury. It turns out it's just like a bone bruise um, on his knee, and he's, gonna, he's day to day. He left this game like late in the third quarter when the team was down 34 to 10. So now you're looking at the Detroit offense without Golden Tate, without Marvin Jones, and down 24 points in the fourth quarter. Like this is all strictly garbage time. Like obviously Kenny Galladay is going to put up numbers. Uh, now you look at his fourth quarter numbers. He saw six of his 13 targets in that fourth quarter. He caught two of them for 30 yards and his only touchdown in that fourth quarter in garbage time without any other weapons on the field. So, like, you look at this game and you could be like, oh, yeah, sick. Like, Kenny Galladay got me 17 fantasy points or whatever. But that was all – it was it was very, very fluky um, when, you, when you look at how he produced. And I just don't like how this offense is running. It's not very fluid. They don't have that, like, escape route in Golden Tate to go to. And I think it's really going to um, make Stafford and this, this offense struggle down the stretch. What's more concerning is the schedule that you can see here on the screen. This is a, a brutal, a brutal slate of games for a number one wide receiver, which I, I would assume Kenny Galladay kind of is at this point. Now, Carolina is not necessarily a uh, defense that you need to fade, but I included football outsiders, DBOA versus wide receiver ones on the opposing team. 
and they are number two in the NFL. Carolina is Chicago. We obviously know they're not an easy team to pass against, especially when you have Quill Mack back in the game and getting pressure on the quarterback. doesn't really allow for the wide receivers like Kenny Galladay to get downfield and make those big plays. Rams are pretty much the only green on this entire chart, and it's because Tlaib has not been there. By week 13, he is expected to be back. So that's a tough matchup. He gets Patrick Peterson the week after that, Tredavious White the week after that, Xavier Rhodes the week after that. It's just a ridiculous fucking slate of matchups for Kenny G. So I do not like what I've seen since State is gone. I do not like the schedule going forward. It is all bad news in Detroit. What do you think about that, Noah? Is that facts? Uh, I totally agree with you. I got him in my main league. I mean, it's kind of tough having a guy like Kenny Galladay, who when you watch him play, he's just incredible. But Matt Stafford has about, like, two seconds to throw the ball. They're not moving the ball upfield. I mean, he got a red zone catch last week for a touchdown. But if you look at these defenses he's playing, how many times are they going to get there in the future? I mean, Chicago's locking everybody down. I mean, Buffalo's been really good against quarterbacks. They're probably going to get to him. Arizona with Chandler Jones coming off the edge, that's going to be tough. I mean, Minnesota in your championship week, that's going to be real tough. And if you look at the chart that Nick put up, the three defenses that look like the least imposing, the Rams, Arizona, and Buffalo, weeks 13, 14, 15, those are teams that get torn up on the ground. I mean, the Rams, the both times they faced Seattle, I'm pretty sure they gave up like near 200, 300 rushing yards to like Mike Davis and Rashad Penny. Arizona, we all know, stink. And Buffalo is just gates open. I mean, they're probably just going to feed carry on Johnson. Those are going to be lower scoring games. Obviously not the Rams game, but what do you expect that a Matt Stafford to do with like uh, Aaron Donald and Dominic and Sue, Dante Fowler coming at him? Yeah, He's exactly. Not a good slate. And even those ones that you say are like the least imposing ones, those all have lockdown cornerbacks. Tredavious White, Patrick Peterson, Akeem Tlaib. Like those are three guys you don't want your wide receiver to face off on. And uh, as much as you love Kenny G, he's not the guy that's – he's not like unfadeable. He's not Antonio Brown. So it's not like, oh, I feel comfortable throwing him in the lineup at any point. So Kenny G is the second wide receiver I'm selling high on. So we are going to shift it back over to uh, another buy low. I know you got another one for us, Noah. Who, who, uh, who are we targeting? All right, we got another receiver, and he's not a young guy like Kenny Galladay. He's probably one of the older guys in the league. It's Larry Fitzgerald. I know a lot of you were disappointed. Thinking he was like a wide receiver, like 12 overall. He kind of disappointed. I mean, he didn't have a top 50 finish in his first six games. But then the last couple, he finished as wide receiver 24, wide receiver 8, and this past week was wide receiver 29. And I know you're going to say maybe it's too late to buy low on him. But if you look at his last game, I mean, six catches for 50 yards, people might be like, oh, those last two are a fluke. Byron Leftwich doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Like Mike McCoy is a bum. This guy is too. Josh Rosen can't throw to his own team. He's colorblind. Like a lot of arguments to go against him. But if you look at this game, six for 50, look at other slot receivers that uh, face off against them. I mean, Kendall Fuller is one of the best slot corners in the league. He held Jarvis Landry to the exact same stat line. Uh, Emmanuel Sanders put up four for 57 against them. Edelman, four for 51 in a touchdown. Tyler Boyd, three for 27. And that's when A.J. Green was there. I mean, for as bad as a pass defense they've been, they've been extremely good against slack uh, wide receivers. And you could use that to your advantage when trying to buy low on him. I mean, obviously, Arizona's uh, offense isn't the best. But they've obviously been improved ever since Byron Leftwich came in because Mike McCoy, all he wanted to do was run it right up the middle with David Johnson and just throw to Ricky Seals-Jones, who has absolutely no hands. It's a guy I missed on this offseason. The other promising thing that we saw in Week 10 was he saw 10 targets. And over the past three weeks, I think he's seen a total of either 28 or 30 targets. He leads the team in red zone and end zone looks. He's run 34 more routes the past three weeks. I mean, he's obviously the number one in this offense. They're treating him as such. And similar to John Brown, the schedule he gets upcoming is Oakland, the Chargers, Green Bay, Detroit, Atlanta, the Rams, and Seattle. And all of them give up, uh, I don't know how to word this, but like 15 or better points per game. The only team that allows like a league low or uh, half of the league low, however you want to say, no, is hold Seattle. On. Let's, let's figure they rank out. bottom 15. Let's figure out what you're trying to yeah. say. Okay, so <laughs> what, 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 what is the statistic? <laughs> all right. They're, they're all ranked within the top 15? In points allowed, except for Seattle. So, like, the Rams allow the 15th most. Or so they're all in, like, the top half of the league in terms of, like, friendliest defenses to slot receivers? Yeah, okay. or, like, receivers in general. Okay. Like, okay. they give up a ton of fantasy points to receivers is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, that's not a, it's, that's not a scary schedule whatsoever. And, yeah, I mean, just uh, – I, I do like what we're seeing from the Cardinals offense since Leftwich has taken over. I think people are – 
getting a little crazy about it. Um, I don't think they've looked that good. Um, but I think people are probably seeing Fitz and David Johnson start producing. So they're all automatically like, oh, this offense is like good now, which is still not the case. But I do like what they're doing with Fitz. He kind of came in and he was like, listen, we're going to make Fitz the guy again. Like, what the fuck is Christian Kirk doing as a wide receiver one when we have Larry Fitzgerald, like a top five wide receiver of all time at our disposal? Let's get him involved. And he's done that since. And like you said, like, even if you're going to look at the box score, this is why we're here, people, because you can't just look at the box scores. We're looking at Fitz's game. While it might have not looked great in terms of statistics, relatively speaking to other wide receivers that have had the same matchup, have performed at a much lesser extent. So you look at Fitz's schedule going forward, and he does take on, you know, Oakland next week. And Oakland, um, I, don't, I don't need to say much more than, than their team name. So Oakland's a good matchup now. And he's got a lot of good matchups going forward. <laughs> Um, so Fitz, yeah, I can, I can agree with, uh, Fitz as a buy low and he's another guy like John Brown and Fitz are both guys that you don't really even need to, um, I don't know, like they might even be available in your leagues, which is crazy. So who are like, okay, going rest of season, would you rather have, uh, half PPR Dion Lewis or Larry Fitzgerald? Don't hurt yourself. I think going Larry Fitzgerald, I mean, I don't know how much I trust the Titans offense. I, I'd i go Lewis there. It's close, but I'd go Lewis because he's, he's getting like 20, like 20 touches a game is ridiculous. I don't trust their offense whatsoever either, but I don't trust the Cardinals yeah. offense. Um, Fitzgerald or <laughs> – Fitzgerald or Allen Robinson going forward? I think it's got to be Fitzgerald. I mean, he's getting the slot work. He's getting a bunch of easy matchups, and there's not as many mouths to feed in Arizona as there are in Chicago. Yeah, I'd have to agree with there. Um, Fitzgerald or Fitzgerald or the two Detroit wide receivers rank them. It's a conflict of interest. Yeah, that is tough. I think I'm not going to assume. Answer one. Assuming gonna... Marvin Jones is healthy, I think I'd go Jones, Fitzgerald, Galladay. Okay, interesting. Why do you like Jones over Golly? I don't know. He's just proven to be like the alpha number one. I mean, Galladay's got like the size and speed, and he's getting looks but as you said this past week was mostly because Stafford or because Jones left early I just think Stafford has like the most rapport with him he just when once Golden Tate left I think he got like six targets to Galladay's four in that one game and it was I don't know it seems like if Galladay's going to be getting the number ones and he'll also have easier matchups in those games yeah I'm not sure if, if Galladay will get all those number ones um it's kind of tricky to figure out but like you said he's got the size speed so I'd imagine a lot of like uh a opposing offensive coordinators are going to be like, we have to shut down Galladay. But I, I kind of agree that Jones is just like more consistent. He's got a lot of chemistry going on with um, Stafford and he's one of the only weapons on the team that you can really trust right now with Golden Tate out of there. So, um, so yeah, I can, I can get behind Fitz sandwiched in between those. So that's probably where I would rank him as well. Um, so yeah, that's another, uh, another buy low. For I think you. all those three guys are real close. So. Yeah, exactly. I would imagine like if I did rest of season rankings, they're probably wide receiver, like, 23, 4, 5, or something like that in that range. We'll shift back over to the sell high, but I don't even really want to get too deep into this one. This is Derrick Henry <laughs> of the Titans. Uh, I didn't write any analysis for this one, but, like, I don't like putting players on these lists that are just so – I don't know. It's dumb. Like, you, you, there's nowhere you're going to be able to sell fucking Derrick Henry for. You know what I mean? But, like, I put this out there for the few people because we do get – me and Noah get a ridiculous amount of DMs about – trade offers that people get or, you know, possible trade opportunities. Some of them include Derrick Henry. So if you have the chance to sell Derrick Henry for anything at base value, absolutely do that. He is by far and away not the RB1 there, right? Deion Lewis controls that backfield. Um, Derrick Henry has luckily scored a fuckload of touchdowns over the last few weeks. So if there's ever going to be a time to buy him, it is now. Um, and I know that will not be relevant to 95% of you guys, but just throwing that out there, we're going to shift back over to another buy low candidate and, uh, I know you had Sony Michelle on your list, right, Noah? Yeah. So that's interesting because Michelle's kind of coming back to his own. We did hear the news that Burkhead is um, – Burkhead can be activated within the next, like, couple of weeks. Now, I don't expect him to play a major role because even as Burkhead was healthy in the beginning of the season and Michelle started getting healthy, Burkhead started getting phased out of the offense. So um, I like the idea of buying low on Michelle because he was someone I know we were both kind of high on going into the season. Um, but he's had his, his fair share of injuries. So I want to hear your take on that. Because honestly, when I've watched Michelle, you obviously love the workload in an offense like New England. But like, I don't know, something about it just doesn't. I was talking about uh, about this with someone last night. Like, it doesn't seem like, it's almost like when you're watching David Johnson this year. He doesn't have the explosion 
that we saw in 2016, or it doesn't seem like Sonny Michel is running like we saw him at Georgia. But I mean, again, if the volume is there, um, obviously he's going to be a big fantasy factor down the stretch. So let me know, uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on Michelle? Why do you have him on the buy low list? I think the main reason is because like I have him in my main league and I know I've gotten four straight weeks of duds because he left Chicago early. He sat out two weeks. And then this past week they were getting their blowers, their doors blown off. Yeah. I mean, they weren't really in the game. So he only got what 11 carries for like 30 something yards. So yeah. that's four weeks of nothing. Now he's on by, if you have him on your team, you were likely banking on him as being your RB two. So he could have swung those games for you and you might be desperate to make your fantasy playoffs. And knowing that he's on buy right now, and if you're in a must-win situation, somebody's gonna, somebody's gonna be selling him. If a team is like five and five or four and six, they don't want to have another week of zeros out of him. So you can realistically swing him for like a back-end RB two price if the guy's playing this week. Um, and overall, I mean, he's just getting volume when he plays. He averaged 22 carries, 109 yards from scrimmage, and over a touchdown a game when he played. I mean, those matchups were pretty good, but it's not like the New England Patriots have much going forward. They're an elite offense. They can move the ball. He's getting red zone looks. And just like you said with Burkhead, I mean, if you're going to say uh, Michelle's knee is banged up, you got to say the same about Burkhead. The guy left with a concussion already this year. He put on IR for a neck injury, and he entered the season with a torn something in his knee. I mean, I don't want to touch him. He's not going to get much volume. Yeah. I still think Michelle's a lock for around 20 touches come week 12. Yeah, that's definitely a good selling point on the fact that, like, you can kind of flip the Burkhead script on itself. And, you know, I try to be as pessimistic as, as I possibly can when it comes to injuries because, for the most part, that's how it works out. Like, if you're going to be optimistic about injuries, you're probably – you're making yourself vulnerable when it comes to fantasy football. And if you're like, oh, Rex Burkhead's coming back, it's like, yeah, you just named, like, four serious injuries he's had. So his re-injury risk is probably – very high but for most people that just read oh Burkett's coming back you're like oh fuck that just adds you know that was the that was the problem going into the season that people didn't want to draft Michelle high was like one obviously he was injured but besides that like oh it's the Patriots we never know who we're gonna be able to use who we're gonna be able to trust um so if you're if you were able to kind of guess right on Sonny Michelle you had a, a lot of good games but it seems like he's kind of had an unlucky streak whether it was usage or the injuries or whatever so when he comes back yeah I mean I I, I definitely agree that he's someone um, that you can grab now and he will produce, even if it's for like, this is probably more for teams that maybe have a little bit of cushion to, to work with. Um, so if he does have another kind of like, you know, he has the buy obviously, but if he has another down game or if he needs to be worked back in, then you can give him a little bit of leeway. Um, same thing with this next guy I want to talk about, like AJ green. We've heard that he probably won't be back till December. So we just had week 11, week 12 is this upcoming week. Week 13 is the last week in November. Wait, 11? No, this is week 11 coming up. So, yeah, yeah, well, okay. so the first week of December would be week 13. Most fantasy playoffs start uh, – some, some people start week 14 if you have a bigger league and you have buys or whatever. Most are 15, 16. Um, so I, I just made a trade in one of my leagues for A.J. Green. So it's a 14-team league. So six teams get in the playoffs. And I am in um, either first – I think first, either first or second place. Like I, I'm almost guaranteed a lock to get in out of the top six teams. And uh, the guy who has A.J. Green is maybe four and five or something like that. And he's battling for a playoff spot. So he's like, he put in the chat, he was like, listen, I'm selling A.J. Green for like cents on the dollars. So I started offering him trades and I eventually settled on giving him um, Corey Davis and Lamar Jackson. It's a super flex league, two quarterbacks. Um, but I think like it was, you know, it was a steal for me because I'm not going to need Green right now. And by the time he's back, because I kind of already locked up a playoff spot, he'll be back in my lineup and then I'll get to pair him. Like in a 14 team league, when you can pair – AJ Green with like Stefan Diggs, Emmanuel Sanders, and like my team is, is good in that for a 14 league. I have a lot of depth. So, what basically the whole fucking point of me rambling right now is to tell you that if you have cushion to work with on your team and you're pretty much locked up in the playoffs, I would start lowballing offers for AJ Green, especially if the, uh, if the owner is fighting for a playoff spot. Because, same thing that you said with like Michelle, like you need points now, you need to get wins now. So, um, you have a lot of leverage if you already have that locked up spot. I am kind of concerned though. To be honest, um, luckily I didn't give away a lot. But if week 17 came, right, if we fast forward all the way to weeks right, from right now to week 17 and I heard the news that A.J. Green was on the IR, wouldn't surprise me whatsoever. Like, I don't like the whole fucking foot toe thing. I feel like a lot of those injuries end up on the IR. So that kind of scares me. So don't, don't say I didn't warn you about that. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to put in a little piece about A.J. Green because I know that's, uh, that's been on a lot of people's 
Twitter fingers and coming my way. So um, I don't know if you have anything else to put in on, on AJ Green there, yeah. or we can head over to the next guy, whatever you want. Just quickly, yeah, I, I agree on Green. If you can afford to take those couple zeros or whatever, by the time, if he does come back, weeks 14, 15, 16, I mean, he could be the one that, like, swings your fantasy championship. Uh, he's been – I'm thinking, like, he's having a career year, right? I think he's on pace for something like 1,300 yards and around 10, 12 touchdowns. I yeah, mean, really solid wide receiver one numbers. I and I Andy Dalton, like, seems to only throw to him. So, I mean, he's got Tyler Boyd, but he's still obviously the number one solidified wide receiver there. Yeah, exactly. He's he's going to get the volume. He's got the floor tar. He's a, he's, you're getting a high-end wide receiver one there if you can get him for pennies on the dollar like I did. Um, I was The only thing I was nervous about was I have Big Ben and Tom Brady at quarterback there, and Brady's on a bye week 12. So if Lamar Jackson gets a start, he gets Cincinnati. So it's like a great matchup, but it's a lot of moving parts there. The other thing is like, Tom Brady low-key has kind of sucked ass as a fantasy quarterback this year, man. He has not been putting up numbers. And I think a lot of it can probably be, you know, Josh Gordon wasn't there and Julian Edelman missed four games and Gronk's been out for like nine games now. So it's like it's hard to trust Tom Brady moving forward because he's been someone that I've just plugged and played and not really thought about it. And then like of recently, I've been looking back at some of the numbers. I'm like, he kind of sucks. And like Big Ben is carrying me from the quarterback position. So the fact that Lamar Jackson had such a good schedule down the stretch – um, was like it kind of made me hesitant there even though I knew I was winning the trade because of where my team was it was just like I don't know if I want to move away from Lamar Jackson right now but I think there was just too many question marks with the fact that like Joe Flacco might just end up starting the rest of the season and then you know it's a dud trade for him just like Davis for Green straight up but uh yeah. enough rambling about AJ Green and Lamar Jackson and the whole AFC South North whatever fucking division they're in um let's move on to the next player who else we got on it do we have anyone else on this list uh for by low no but sell high we got we got, got a tennessee okay. wide receiver Corey davis oh the guy i just sold beautiful beautiful segue well <laughs> you see with Corey davis this guy he's seeing a whole bunch of targets on an offense with a quarterback that can't feel his fingers and <laughs> i mean i know you guys see the last game where he put up crazy numbers finishes a wide receiver four and you're saying Look, Corey Davis, he's the guy that we always wanted. He's the guy that was the sleeper of the year. Look at him putting up, like, ridiculous performances against uh, Stephon Gilmore, who's been locking up everybody. Don't forget that last year he did the same exact shit against the Patriots in the playoffs. Then he started this year putting up dud after dud. He's seen more 10-target games than top 24 finishes this season. He's finished as a top 24 receiver twice and has seen 10 or more targets 10 times. I mean, you can see all the targets you want. But in an offense that doesn't throw the ball with an elite defense that doesn't score, I don't care if you see a 50% target share. I'm just not buying in on him. He's seen 31.3% of the targets on an offense that I think they only throw about 30 times a game. They don't really get to the red zone all that much. I mean, obviously this week they have. And if you look at their defense, they're allowing the least points per game. I think it's something in the realm of like 16 points, 17 points. And they're only putting up like 18 to 19 points a game. And the only games that Davis has been usable inside the top 50 were games that Tennessee's put up at least 20 points, which is above their average. So if you think that their defense is just going to fall apart, then sure, maybe he could be usable because they're going to be throwing the ball. But they've proven week after week that they're going to go out there, they're going to stop the opponent, and they're just going to run the ball with Derrick Henry for <laughs> God knows what reason. And then Deion Lewis is just going to house a 70-yard touchdown. I mean, that hasn't happened too much yet, but we can hope. And yeah, I mean, Corey Davis, it's it's kind of a similar situation to Allen Robinson. It's like these quarterbacks that you don't trust. The offense is somewhat streaky. They have a good defense, and Tennessee's defense is legit, which is a reason – one of the reasons why the next guy on this list is uh, is, is sort of a sell-high candidate as well. Or wait, did they just play? Did the Colts-Titans just play? Am I making shit up? No, right? Tennessee's still on the Colts' schedule next week. Uh, let me see. Yeah, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's Colts-Tennessee. So, okay, okay. And we that. Team, so nobody plays that. I played myself. All right. Yeah. With Corey Davis, it's like, I think upside blinds people of consistency often in fantasy football. And you see the flashy upside plays and it's great when you have them in your lineup for that week. But I, I tend to fade guys or try to trade them for value. Um, I just try to stay away from those guys that, that have those upside weeks every now and then like legitimately, what's the difference between, I know, I, I know everyone sees like, Corey Davis as this legitimate wide receiver one, like big build and, and, you know, running good routes and whatever. But like he has the same potential as a Deshaun Jackson week over week and people aren't high on Deshaun Jackson, but he'll have a splash play. Corey Davis will have, I know he'll have his games where he catches 10 balls or whatever, but like 
I don't see a much in my eyes, I don't see much of a difference on a week over week basis. You trying to decipher who to play because like on any given week, either of those two can go off, but they've shown to be extremely volatile. Um, so yeah, I like that. I like that Corey Davis um, sell there. And since I was talking about the Tennessee defense, one of the reasons that the next guy's on this list, Marlon Mack um, happens to play Tennessee very soon, which is actually in like four days depending on when this is going to come out on Thursday yeah so in three days they play uh Tennessee's been very 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 good against the run and uh so in one of my leagues I traded Marlon Mack and uh Keenan Allen for Travis Kelsey and this was three weeks ago so since that trade Mack had those two monster games and then the bad game but I knew going into the trade I was like he plays Buffalo and he plays Oakland like he's gonna explode and I just have to live with that like I know that I'm giving up a, a high production value at running back for those two weeks my thing was like, I don't know if he's going to be able to keep up that production um, against normal defenses, right? Because the, their team has relied heavily on the passing game. And I think the only reason that they're going to be feeding Mac 25 touches a game is when they're in game scripts like Oakland or Buffalo, right? Those aren't going to happen often. So now they run into a schedule that gets a little bit tougher. So you're going to see what Mac brings to the table. And we saw that in week 10 a little bit, right? When he struggled to really produce anything even uh, relevant to what he did in the previous two weeks. So um, I know you kind of knocked down this analysis in the blog post, Noah, so why don't you kind of jump in there. Tell me tell me what you hate about Mac. Uh, other than everything, well, the next six weeks, <laughs> he faces um, one defense who ranks in the top 10 of fancy points allowed to the position, meaning he's got a tough road ahead. He gets the Titans. They allow the fourth least point, points to the position. Miami, that's the fourth most, so that's the game you're going to want to start him. Jacksonville, eighth least. They limited him to 38 yards last week. Uh, Houston, 19th most, so still back end. Cowboys, ninth least. Giants, 14th most. So in reality, the only good games are Miami and maybe the Giants. But to be able to play the Giants, you got to make it all the way to week 16. And to make it to week 16, you got to play guys like against Houston, Jacksonville, the Cowboys. He's not going to be the guy that's going to bring you to week 16. Sure, if you have other pieces around you that can – uh, provide points like a Todd Gurley, like an Adam Thielen, like Patrick Mahomes. Sure, if you can make it to week 16, he'll be a good play that week. But I wouldn't be banking on him to bring me to that position. And right now, if you can send him off for a guy like Joe Mixon, who put up a dud week, who's still a back end or mid uh, tier uh, running back one, I would because people are like living off recency bias. So if you can ship off a guy who's put up like 400 yards from scrimmage over the past four weeks for a guy who you know is going to see 20 tar or 20 touches a week. I would definitely yeah. do that. I think it's, it's not so much like Marlon Mack is bad, right? He's going to keep getting a volume. He's going to keep getting the volume in this, in a good offense. Like the Colts have been legit, very good this year. Um, the problem is he's probably going to give you a lot of RB two, like middling games, like he said. So it's not necessarily like you need to get him off your team, but there's probably high value in the trade market for a guy like Marlon Mack, especially for teams that are desperate at running back. I would easily flip Marlon Mack for Dalvin Cook going forward. Um, I would probably go Marlon Mack and like pair him with another sell high wide receiver on this list and see if you could even like really upgrade at running back. Go uh, Marlon Mack and either Allen Robinson or Kenny Galladay and flip him for, you know, a, a higher, I'm not going to tell you like fucking Kareem Hunt or something because no one's going to do that, but you know, someone in maybe like the five to eight range, something like that. So I think taking a couple of guys on these sell high lists and kind of mashing them together based on what you see going forward in terms of like the schedule and the outlook is, is a good idea. And I know a lot of the trade deadlines are coming up either this weekend or next weekend. So now is kind of the time to do that. But yeah, like you said, it's like middling matchups. So with a guy like Marlon Mack, you need, you, you're going to need good game script. I mean, he does get involved in all facets of the game, but we saw, Naeem Hines was involved last week. Um, even Jordan Wilkins busted out a big run. So it's like, I don't trust Mac as what people perceive his value to be unless it's a really, really good matchup. And I think that's kind of the point to hammer home here is just like, I don't know, Mac, Mac's value is probably very high. So like last week probably would have been the, the time to trade him. But I think even if I owned him, I would have been like, oh shit, like Mac's been really good. Maybe he can keep this up. So I, personally, I wouldn't have moved him after last week. But I think now if you could still get that, you know, low end RB one, high end RB two value, stack it with someone else, flip it, switch it, stack the revenue. You got someone knocking on the door coming in. They want in on big dogs. No, that's just wind. We got a crazy wind going on. Oh shit. Where you're at UConn, right? Yeah. It's snowing earlier. Really? Yeah. We had a little bit of snow. Crazy Jersey. shit going on. Yeah. The, the weather's getting crazy. Winter's winter is absolutely coming. Um, I don't think we had anyone else on this list. Did we? No, I don't think so. All right. Well, that's probably going to wrap up our uh, buy low, sell high for week 11. 
um, before we exit, I have to say thank you to our sponsors, fantasyjocks.com. You'll know what it is. Make sure you guys get yourself a belt, a ring, a trophy, whatever it is for your fantasy league. The playoffs are coming up. Make sure you crown your champion. The coolest part about these things is that you could actually get the team's names engraved on the side and whatnot so you can keep track records of who has won the league. And I know you all want to be sporting this around once you take the chip home. After you trade away Derrick Henry and Allen Robinson and Marlon Mack, you'll be able to do so. Um, that's it, though. Make sure you are following my man Noah um, on Twitter, at FBGod. That will all be linked down below. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Uh, give this video a thumbs up if you liked it or if you hated it. I don't really give a shit. Drop a comment down below. Let us know what you want to see moving forward in the, uh, in the content. Let Noah know what he did wrong. Let, let him know what he did right. Whatever it is, I don't really care. Do something, so, some kind of fucking engagement to help the YouTube algorithm, people. Uh, and that's going to be all. So I will see you all on Saturday for the top DFS plays. Adios.